Mustang is a special podcast production of Boise State Public Radio and the Mountain West News Bureau. Support for this series comes from Barbarian Brewing, who believes all it takes is a few untamed minds, a little elbow grease, and a few pints of beer to make true innovation happen. I remember the first time I visited the wild horse corrals outside of Burns, Oregon. It's a desolate place, sagebrush for miles around, scattered juniper trees, and a dozen or so enormous corrals or pens with these high metal fences. You can drive your car around and look at all the horses being held there, hundreds, even thousands at times. Sorrels, paints, black ones, white ones, bays. These horses all used to be wild roaming the public lands of this region in small family bands and herds, stallions protecting their mares, raising colts and fillies, looking for food and water, and not always finding it. The Bureau of Land Management gathers these horses up and brings them to facilities like this one and others around the country to live out their lives in captivity. I remember feeling so sad, watching these horses standing around, just doing time, The males castrated and separated from the females, the young ones separated from the older ones. And sure, they have plenty of food and water, but it makes your heart hurt thinking about what these horses have lost. I stayed for hours. So did David Phillips, the first time he went to the government corrals near Colorado Springs. He was a reporter at the time for the Colorado Springs Gazette. And... One Saturday, there wasn't much news going on, so I went to a BLM adoption fair down at the local prison. Adoption fairs are events where the Bureau of Land Management invites the public to come bid on and adopt Mustangs. And, you know, to be honest, I didn't even know that wild horses still existed, let alone that they were being auctioned off by the federal government. And so I thought, well, this will be an interesting story. Little did I know. So David hangs around the corrals, and at the end of the day, he asks the staff how many horses were adopted. They said, only four. The rest, he's told, will go into government storage, basically captivity for the rest of their lives. Right now, there are 50,000 wild horses in government holding facilities around the country. 50,000. And I was just gobsmacked. You know, I just kept thinking, how did we get into this situation. The American West has a Mustang problem, and it's got a lot of people riled up for a lot of different reasons. I'm Ashley Ahern, and this is Mustang, a show about a wild horse who's learning the world of humans, and a human, this human, who's trying to understand the complicated world of Mustangs. You know, this this is a, a volatile issue. It's been described as one of the most wicked natural resource issues of this century. Terry Mesmer is the Quinney Professor for Wildlife Conflict Management at Utah State University. He's been studying the wild horse issue for decades. The Bureau of Land Management says Western ecosystems can support about 30,000 wild horses. But right now, there are more than 80,000 out there roaming across the West, And that number rises by 10 to 20 percent every year. This is a crisis. It's a crisis not only involving ecology, but it's a crisis involving our ability to communicate and to relate to each other as individuals. Mesmer says the wild horse problem is different from other environmental problems because wild horses are different from other wild animals. People have strong feelings about them feelings that are often connected to deeply entrenched belief systems and identities. We'll get into all that on this show, but for now, here are the basics of how it looks on the ground. Wild horses eat grass, of course, so that means that if you talk to ranchers, some will tell you mustangs compete with their cows for food and therefore present a threat to their way of life. For biologists, that grazing, and sometimes overgrazing, can pose a serious threat to the ecosystems and creatures they've devoted their careers to studying and protecting. 
And then there are the wild horse activists, people who photograph the horses, give them names, and believe that Mustangs have a right to live out their lives in freedom on the open range. So the activists sue the BLM to prevent it from rounding up wild horses. Ranchers sue the BLM to force it to do the roundups. And a lot of other people wring their hands and worry about all the taxpayer dollars that are spent keeping horses in long-term holding facilities. You know, here is this thing that is the symbol of everything that is wild and free that is being held captive at great expense. David Phillips, the reporter from Colorado, is now a Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist with The New York Times. He mainly covers the military, but in 2017, he published a book called Wild Horse Country. It's great, all about the history, myth, and future of the Mustang. And for him, that first day at the government corrals, it wasn't just the horses that drew him in. It was what they represented, something so much bigger. You know, it was just such a contradiction. And to me, immediately that suggested that there was a really compelling human history behind it. Because after all, wild horses didn't create their modern predicament. We did. And so to understand how they ended up where they did, we have to understand the human history of the West. So in the early times when the Spanish and other countries of the European continent started coming this way, well, this guy named Cortez was a Spaniard, and he landed in Mexico in that, on that lower part of the Americas. And so when he arrived, he brought the horse. Warren Saylor is a historian and elder of the Spokane tribe of eastern Washington. The generally held understanding is that horses first came to the American continent with the conquistadors in the late 1400s and early 1500s. People like Hernán Cortés, who went to Mexico looking for gold and ended up claiming Mexico for Spain and wiping out the Aztec Empire in the process. And then he started moving north to the lower part of what is today the United States. As he started pushing into the territory of the Navajo and the Hopi and the Comanche and the Apache, the, when those, t- those tribes got tired of him, they pushed him back south, back out of our part of the continent. But the horses remained. And many different nations began cultivating their own herds, building bloodlines over generations, and using them to transport goods, hunt, and fight off colonizers. And then as those horse herds grew, then they became a trade item because tribes always had trade routes throughout the United States. And so we, we began that one-to-one relationship with those four-legged animals. Um, from that point forward, they just became a part of us. Horses are still culturally significant to so many indigenous nations of the West. The Lakota, the Yakima, the Warm Springs, the Navajo, the Nez Perce, the Colville, to name just a few, all manage herds on their reservations to this day. But in the 1800s, they weren't just a symbol. They were a weapon of resistance for indigenous peoples as white settlers began to encroach on their ancestral lands. In his book, David Phillips estimates that by the early 1900s, there were maybe a million wild horses in the West. That's more than 10 times what there are today. Early European explorers reported seeing enormous herds of wild horses. That were so vast that they looked like the waves of the ocean, that they took an hour to ride past, even though they were running in the opposite direction. And those explorers around the campfire started telling stories. Stories about their adventures, about the Wild West, about the Mustangs they were encountering. And there was this one story that took hold of everyone's imagination. Tell me about the White Stallion. Well, I can't tell you the story of the White Stallion because there's probably a thousand stories of the White Stallion, most of them never written down. But David does a pretty darn good job of capturing the gist of the story in his book. Explorers and settlers would try to catch Mustangs, and many of them did. They were turned into cart horses in New York City. They were used as pack horses and plow horses to homestead land. They became a tool in the taming of the West. But there was a story about one stallion, the white stallion, that 
could never be caught. It was the most gorgeous animal, the storytellers assured everyone else, that had ever been seen. Tall, regal, and it would always be seen out standing on the horizon. But if any rider tried to go after it, it would just lope away, disappearing into the distance. The cowboys all tried to catch that white stallion. They would chase him into a box canyon, or they would set up a trap, or they would corral him by the river, or they would find the most beautiful mare and try to lure him in. But the white stallion always outsmarted them. He jumped the highest fences, eluded the cowboys, made off with the beautiful mare. He was indomitable, just so purely wild. And why that resonated with the storytellers, I think says something about that time and how Americans viewed themselves. Uh, It says that nature, that the West, the frontier, was boundless, all-powerful, you know, so much more mighty than, than any one human that it could never be tamed or fully encompassed. The horse embodied that. The white stallion may have never been caught, but hundreds of thousands of Mustangs were. For much of the early to mid-1900s, wild horses were rounded up and slaughtered at facilities around the country. Their meat was shipped abroad for human consumption and canned in the U.S. for dog food. Their populations plummeted. By the 1950s, there was maybe only about 40,000 horses left. Hardly any. Uh, And so it was just this big industrial liquidation of a natural resource. And it was part of the larger liquidation of all natural resources in, in North America. David says Americans were harvesting Mustangs the same way they were clear-cutting old-growth forests. Ours was a land of plenty, and there was plenty to take, until there wasn't. That rude awakening went hand-in-hand hand with the rise of the environmental movement of the 1970s. You've probably heard of the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act. Well, there's another one you might have missed that also spoke to the conservation spirit of the times. In 1971, Congress passed the Wild and Free Roaming Horse and Burrow Act. The act made it illegal for the public to capture or kill wild horses and burrows or donkeys. The Bureau of Land Management was put in charge of wild horses on public lands. And it worked. Maybe a little too well. Wild horse populations have been on the rise ever since. To the point where now we humans are divided about what to do about it. Yay, we saved the wild horse. Shoot! Now what do we do with all these horses? And that brings us to our current predicament, with lawsuits flying back and forth, crowded government corrals, and wild horses living out their lives in captivity. As a little girl growing up in the humdrum suburbs of Massachusetts, I dreamed of wild horses roaming free somewhere out west, a place I'd never been but I knew I would see someday. Now, I live in a little cabin in rural Washington state, sagebrush country, not too far from wild horse country. And the Mustang myth has become more real to me. The thing is, Mustangs don't just have to either roam free or sit in government corrals. If given the chance, they can thrive in our world. They've been trained to be champion cow horses, jumpers, endurance racers, you name it. They're smart and hardy. They also make for some of the safest riding and pack horses in the mountains. To me, the story of the Mustang is a story about possibility. For $125, and of course if you meet some requirements, the federal government will let you adopt your own Mustang, take it home, and try to train it. So that's what brought me to the BLM corrals outside of Burns, Oregon last year. I wanted to see it for myself, but I also wanted to take home my very own Mustang. And I should note here that I have never trained a horse. I know how to ride, but training a horse, especially a horse who's never been around people, is next level. There is a high likelihood that I am biting off way more than I can chew. But that doesn't usually stop me. Anyway, I spent hours standing on the fence, arms wrapped around the railings like a little girl just watching mares and geldings, young and old. I watched the way they moved and interacted. I didn't know exactly what I was looking for. But there was one 
little black horse with a bright white spot on his forehead that caught my eye. I have a video on my phone of him from that first day. Hey, handsome. What you doing? I'm just looking. Horses are prey animals, so if they can't run away, they want to form a tight bunch when they perceive a threat. At the corrals, most of the horses were doing just that, huddled together on the far side of the pen to get as far away from me as possible. But this one little black horse just squared off, stood his ground, and watched me walk around the corral. What you doing, little one? What do you think? He was afraid, I could tell but so defiant and scrawny, but clearly curious. He's checking me out. Might as well take a picture. You're not moving. It's like his presence. I just had a feeling he was the one. So I had him taken to a different facility to get some initial training, basically just to be able to get a halter on his head so I could attempt to take him home. And I watched the cowboys working with him. I have video of him from then. He just ran and thrashed around until he was lathered white with sweat and fear. Boy, was he wild. They said they'd never seen a horse kick and fight so hard. It was hard to watch this wild animal realizing how small his world had become. I mean, he'd spent his whole life in wide open, remote country with little human interaction. And now he's in this noisy facility with tractors, and dogs, and cowboys all around. I remember feeling sad about everything this horse had lost. And I was also scared. Like, what have I done? I am in way over my head. And here's this dangerous wild animal that I have no business trying to train or even be around for that matter. But in spite of my fear, I remember feeling in that moment that I desperately wanted to be in the corral with him. I wanted to comfort him and try and make him feel safe. So I waited until he'd stopped racing and was just standing frozen, his jaw clenched so tight, his eyes darting all around him like he was ready to bolt. And then I climbed over the fence. I walked up to him slowly. I didn't come straight at him. Again, prey animals, so no direct eye contact, kept my eyes down, and I just moved up sideways next to him until I was standing shoulder to shoulder with him. The two of us, looking out on the world together for the first time. Good boy, yeah. It's okay, there's a lot going on here, buddy. I focused on taking deep breaths and calming my body because horses pick up on all the signals we don't even realize we're sending. Be brave. Be brave. And then I reached up and gently touched his neck. And he flinched, but he didn't run. I'm just putting my hands on him. And I can tell he's nervous, but he just licked and chewed a little bit, which means he's relaxing. And I just want this horse to know that he's safe with me and that we're going to be friends for a long time. I'm going to come home with me and we're going to be friends. We're going to have lots of adventures. There's a lot going on, buddy. There's a lot going on. It's going to be okay, though. Good. Good boy. That's right. I'm safe. I'm safe. We're going to be friends. Now, Boo and I are on a journey together. And getting to know him has also been about getting to know his world, both the context and the conflict that surrounds the wild horse issue. Why do people get so fired up about wild horses? Why are there so many out there now? What impacts are they having? And what do we do about it? First up, I want to start at Wild Horse Ground Zero, the place where there are more Mustangs than anywhere else in the United States. We're a bastard child. (laughs) So? (laughs) No one cares about us. They have no idea that we're the driest state in the Union. And the ecosystem is going to collapse. I would give 
parts of Nevada a decade. That's all it's got left. With this number of horses on it. Yeah. And then there's not going to be anything for anyone or any animal. What happens to sage grouse, mule deer, and other critters when wild horse populations boom? That's next. If you're enjoying Boo's story, and there's a little person in your life who you think might enjoy it too, I wanted to let you know that I wrote a kid's book to accompany this podcast. It's beautifully illustrated by Katie Michael, who did the art for this series. You can get your very own copy at thelittleblackmustang.com. That's thelittleblackmustang.com. Mustang is edited and sound designed by Liza Yeager. Art for the series is by Katie Michael. This is my voice. It can tell you a lot about me, and I'm not changing it for anyone. In NPR's Black Stories, Black Truths, you'll find a collection of NPR episodes centered on the Black experience. Search NPR Black Stories, Black Truths wherever you get podcasts.